Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Hester, and I'd like to talk to you today about COVID and a well-known psychological effect called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Basically, what the Dunning-Kruger effect says is that it's often the person who knows absolutely nothing about a field that imagines that they are the true expert and they know everything that they are so ignorant about it that they do not have enough knowledge to recognize the depth of their own ignorance. So over here, we're talking about people who know nothing about a field, but are supremely confident. This is a thing that's sometimes referred to as Mount Stupid. Okay. Over here, on the other hand, you've got people who truly are experts. Strangely, though, sometimes the real experts have less confidence about their knowledge than the people over there on Mount Stupid because they recognize how complicated it really is. Okay, now I am not an epidemiologist. I'm an astrophysicist. What that means, though, is that I've spent my career working with the same kinds of mathematics, working with similar processes, working with the same kinds of large computer models that epidemiologists use, um, I read the epidemiological literature, which means I'm over here kind of well past the it's starting to make sense to me, but I'm not going to claim to be an expert in the field. Okay, why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because uh, somebody sent me this video, and it's a woman in the business school at Washington University in St. Louis, Anne Marie Knott, who doesn't know anything whatsoever about epidemiology, but still imagines that she knows more than all of the epidemiologists and all of the immunologists in the world, and that she recognizes that COVID isn't a real thing, even though they all think it is. And the reason why I'm taking the time to, to respond to this is that the Olin Town Hall, this is apparently some real event that was a Washington University event. She's got the, the Washington University seal there. There are like 85,000 people who have watched this thing. And it is absolutely wrong from start to finish. And yet, because she's from Washington University and a researcher and all of these kinds of things, doubtless there are a lot of people out there who got their ideas about COVID from what she had to say. And that is irresponsible and it's dangerous because the things that she had to say could literally get people killed. Anyway, back over here. To dive in, we have to talk a little bit about the way that epidemiology actually works. Here we've got the number of infected people. The number of infected people is influenced by two things. You've got new infections that's adding to the number of infected people. And then you've got people over here that are getting well or dying, okay? And if you get well or die, then that reduces the number of infected people. That's basic immunology 101. And for those who know the math, you set up a differential equation, you solve it, this is a simplified form and you find out that you get exponential growth, um, I'm going to write this a little bit differently and say that the number of infected people is however many infected people you started with times a different form of this, e to the alpha 1 minus 1 over r. Why do I bother to do it that way? Here I was just talking about number of people getting infected minus number of people getting well. When I write it this way, that r tells you about the, the number of people that a sick person typically gives it to. So, if a sick person typically gives the disease to, to more than one other person, that means the number grows. Exponential growth, that's our greater than one. If a sick person typically gives it to one other person, then the number just stays the same, which is r equal one. And if a sick person gives it to fewer than one other person, then the number declines. So there's R is less than one. Basic immunology. All right, so... I've seen you all in person, and I'm hoping that today's talk will actually make it possible for me to see you again sooner. 
there you find out what Anne Marie Nott is about. She doesn't like COVID. She doesn't want COVID to be real. She would like to have COVID not be real. And so she exercises a whole bunch of motivated reasoning trying to convince herself that it's not. Basically what she winds up doing is she winds up finding a bunch of equations that she doesn't understand and then sort of substituting things into them until she gets an answer that she likes. Um, what she does first, and this is an important thing to do, is she talks about a report that came out of the Imperial College London epidemiology team who had been studying COVID from the very get-go. And what they did, looking at what went on in Wuhan, is they said, all right, in the wild, the replication number is about 2.4. That means that a, an infected person, if you don't do anything about it, will give the disease to about 2.4 other people. And then they said, all right, let's apply that now to what's going on in the, you know, the United States. And they said, well, what will happen is that you'll start off and you'll get this exponential growth where R is greater than 1. As more and more people have had it, then the number of susceptible people goes down, which means that a sick person gives it to fewer people. And eventually you get to a point up here where this is the point where R equals 1, where the number of sick people isn't changing because each sick person is giving it to about one other. And then over here, now lots of people have had it, which means there aren't as many people who are vulnerable, which means that a sick person is giving it to fewer than one person. So that's R is less than 1. So that was their that was their calculation. Now, she didn't like that conclusion, and the reason she didn't like that conclusion was, uh, yeah, kind of obvious because it meant that. Oh, and I, I should say that if you overall in the United States, if you sum up all of these people, they were predicting about two point two million deaths. Here's what she has to say about that: number of deaths and flatten the curve. So the implicit message is that if R0 is already less than 1, these interventions were unnecessary. Okay. Interventions. What interventions do, if we go back up here and look again at our, our epidemic, remember what's going on here, the reason it's growing like that is that a sick person is giving it on average to lots of other people. If the sick person weren't giving it to so many people, it wouldn't grow as fast. And in fact, if you got to the point that people were isolated enough that they really weren't giving it to many people at all, eventually you could even get it to the point where the number was declining. And so school closures, shutdowns, all of that kind of stuff is all about reducing the replication rate. And so let's come back over here. We now know that forecast was high by a factor of 20. The consensus forecast in the US is that 120,000 Americans will die from COVID this year. And I think the public has left the impression that this is a testament to the value of interventions. But what I wanna argue instead is that this 95% decrease in the deaths actually stems from forecast error. And it's Okay, there she is. Let's talk about what's really going on here. She thinks, again, that epidemiologists are idiots, that they could make a, a factor of 20 error and not understand why. Okay, what really happened? What really happened is you go back here again and you say, all right, there was a prediction, and the prediction was that this thing would grow like this. So here was R equal 2.4 and exponential growth. But here we're down here around March 15th. Remember what was going on there? This was about the time where we started having interventions. This was about the time where people started shutting stuff down. And so guess what? When that happened, R got smaller. And when R got smaller, instead of growing like this, it grew like that. 
Now, another thing that she said that's just flat wrong, you heard her say, well, consensus prediction is that there will only be 100,000 deaths this year. That's not true. The consensus, we're already at 100,000. The consensus prediction is that kind of by the middle of June, we're going to be up at around 100 and maybe 10, 120,000. Actually, we're already pretty well there, but it's also continuing to climb. And so the consensus prediction is we're going to see a heck of a lot more deaths in the year than 100,000. All right. Keep going from there. Um, what's she on about next? What she's on about next is this. The first thing that I want to do to persuade you that this is about forecast error rather than the value of interventions is to take a look at flu deaths. Because if it's truly the case that interventions are effective, they should be equally effective at flu as at COVID. So I took a look at that. And what you can see is that flu deaths this year are actually higher than they were last year. Moreover, they're increasing over the period of intervention. All right. Um... Again, she doesn't have the first clue what she's talking about. Look at this. This is influenza plus pneumonia deaths, not just flu deaths. Pneumonia, this is early on. What this really is, is people were seeing COVID present as pneumonia. And so what really is going on here is in 2020, this line is flu plus COVID. And here, what was going on last year, or normal years, is the number of flus is dropping off because we're at the end of the flu season. And so you would expect the flus to be doing this, and yet flu plus COVID was doing this. The difference between those two, there you go, there's COVID. All right, so everything she has to say based on this is just nonsense. However... She's right. If a 95% decrease was from interventions, then flu deaths should also decrease by 95%. And she's right, and they did. And let's talk about how we know that. It's really kind of a fun, fun way that we know that. Um, there's a company called, oh shoot, I forget the name of the company, Kenza. There we go. There's a company called Kenza that will sell you a cute little thermometer that talks to your smartphone and records the temperatures that you measure. And if it records, the temperature that it records, it then uploads to the company. You know, it's anonymized. They're not trying to spy on you. They're just kind of trying to keep track of fevers in different places around the country. It's turned out that the quickest way to spot when COVID infections are starting to crop up is to look at how many people are starting to run fevers. And so you can use these data from the Kinza thermometers to track fever, to, to watch COVID appear. And you can see that. Here, for example, these are measurements from New York City. Um, I'm going to start by talking about this blue line. This blue line is what would be expected for the season. That is, they've been taking these data for a while, and they know, yeah, okay, in February... February, March, the uh, uh, flu season's over, so the number of flu cases are dropping off. But now let's look at what was actually going on in the number of fevers. Well, the number of fevers were climbing like such. That's COVID, okay? And if you look at that, you say, yeah, that kind of looks like an R equal about 2.4 number. And so COVID was on its way like that. But what happened around here? Well, around there is when they started having lockdowns, when they started intervening. When they started intervening, sick people gave it to fewer other people. When that happened, R went down. And when that happened, well, instead of climbing, the number of cases actually started going down. Now, they didn't go down that fast because really... It's that difference between there and there. This area right in here 
is what's telling you about the number of COVID cases. But anyway, the point is, is these cool, fun little thermometers can tell you about COVID. But they also tell you about other sicknesses like the flu. Um, so here we are. Let's look at two different counties. Let's first look at Miami-Dade County in Florida, where COVID started cropping up, and they didn't do anything for a while. And because they didn't do anything for a while, the COVID numbers started climbing. Sorry about that becoming a line. I'll do it again. The COVID numbers started climbing. And the COVID numbers there, they were growing exponentially again with this kind of R equal 2.4 like number that we've seen. But what happened? Well, here we are, state of emergency declared. They closed the schools, which turns out to be a big one. Restaurants and bars closed, shelter in place. This curve that was going like this because of interventions does that. Interventions work. There you see it. But now let's look at another county that actually acted sooner before COVID started to get its foot in the door, really. Santa Clara County in California was cruising along. COVID was just getting started, so left to its own devices. You know, COVID would have done its thing. But there, work from home guidance, restrictions on public gatherings, schools closed, shelter in place ordered. And so instead of doing this, COVID did that. Okay. Interventions caused this to happen, and we can see it. And not only that, she was right. Interventions that bring down COVID also bring down the flu, which is really kind of cool. Here we are in California again. This is a little longer data set, San Francisco area. What have we got? Well, these are numbers of fevers, flu-like diseases, and they're coming down the way that you would expect them to come down. Normally in a year, you would have expected them to do this. But along comes COVID. COVID creates a bump again. COVID was starting to do that, but they put a bunch of interventions in place. And so instead, COVID did this. And now let's look at what happened to disease overall. Diseases overall did this. That's how many flus and such you would have expected. That's how many you saw. And so this is interventions reducing the number of cases of flu, which is exactly what she said you should see. So yeah, she was right about that. That is what you should see. All right, what's up next? Um, yeah, yada, yada, yada. What's up next is she starts talking about the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And for those who don't remember, the Roosevelt was the aircraft carrier that they got a whole bunch of cases of COVID on. And the captain got himself fired and then reinstated. And then Trump didn't want to actually have him get the shot. I don't know. Anyway, it was that case. And she looks at this and let's see what she has to say. Let's find the spot that we're looking for somewhere around there. So if we believe we've reached a steady state here in that... COVID had a chance to fully propagate through the ship in a closed population, meaning nobody was getting on or off the ship, then we can compute R for that outbreak from the attack rate, which I just told you is 17.3%. And when you do that, you get an R value of 0.48. Okay. First of all, if an outbreak fully propagates throughout a closed population, you've got a ship with lots and lots of people on it, and people start getting sick. Do you really think the captain is going to be dumb enough to let those people just continue to mix with everybody else? No. What the captain did is he took the people who were getting sick and he quarantined them. If you had symptoms, you were separated from the rest of the crew. The rest of the crew was, was kept as far apart from each other as they could. I believe that there were masks. In, in other words... What the captain did was everything that he could do to reduce the outbreak. And so COVID did not get to fully propagate through a closed population, as she says. But then you go down here, and here is her 
and come back over here again. Um, here is her calculation where she says, oh, and if I do all of this fun stuff, I calculate that R for this whole thing was only 0.48 because when it started, over 80% of the sailors were already immune. Think about that for a second. If R equaled 0.48, then we know what a disease where R equals 0.48 does. It does that. And yet this disease did that. So you know right off the bat she's wrong. Okay. So what did happen? Well, um, well, actually, let's move on to her next case because she's got another case here that's kind of interesting. Um, do I need to talk? No, that's just that again. She has this case that's now the same kind of thing, except this time it's on the Diamond Princess. About the time I finished my analysis of the ships, I came across an article where researchers had also examined the outbreak on board the Diamond Princess. And I thought, this is great. I can be done worrying about COVID. Uh, they will have arrived at the same conclusion that I had. But instead, they had an r naught estimate of 2.3. So I said, what's going on? I took a look at what they did, and their estimate of r naught came from the first 15 days of the outbreak. And boldly, they forecast forward how many new cases there would be over the, each of the next 10 days. So here's their forecast, and here's the actuals. What you can see is at the end of... Okay, <laughs> I had to play that just because boldly they forecast. Um, fair bit of condescension in there, but let's hear what she says. Days, they're off by a factor of two. They're off by a factor of two, so clearly it's wrong. And she goes back in again and says, oh, well, gee, really, at the very start, 80% had to be sick, yada, yada, yada. Again, what do they do on the Diamond Princess when people started getting sick? Well, the people who were sick were quarantined. The people who weren't sick were locked in their rooms. Um, the, everybody was battened down as as hard as they could. They were sliding food under the doors. They had interventions to stop the spread of the disease. And so what happened? Well, here we had exponential growth. What that forecast was, was, okay, if you don't do anything about it, then this is what the disease is going to do. But instead, they quarantined and they started locking people in their rooms and all of that. And instead, they managed to shut it down. And you can see that here. Here's just a very simple model of what would happen on the Diamond Princess. Here you start off with this many people. If they are right, then there was growth like this. That was this R0 equal 2.3 growth. But along about here, they started clamping things down. And so if it grows at R0 equal 2.3 until you get to this point, where now R0 equals 1. Actually, it's not even R0 equals 1. They managed to push it below that anyway. That's what it looked like if you have growth along with intervention. If she were right, and R on the ship, 80% of the people had it at the very get-go, and R was 0.48, this is what the infection would have looked like. It just would have fallen off exponentially. Again, it's really hard to imagine being this stupid. I, I hate to say it that way, but I don't know what else to say. Okay, here we go. She's already said that she knows more than um, all of the epidemiologists in the world. Here's where she says that she also knows more than all of the immunologists in the world. No, my understanding is that 80% resistance is unusual. It would have to come from unrelated past infections or vaccinations, and I have absolutely no expertise in this area. All I can tell you is that 80% resistance matches the observations from the two ships, and it re reconciles the two R estimates. Okay, again, that last bit. No, it doesn't. 80% um, resistance matches none of the observations of anything. 
And she's right. She doesn't know anything about disease. She thinks that somehow 80% of the population was just immune to COVID straight out of the gate and that all of the immunologists in the world failed to recognize that. Um, somehow they missed the fact that <laughs> nobody had had any immunity to this. They had no antibodies to this. They had no nothing. All of the curves clearly showed there was no immunity, but yeah, she's from a business school at Washington University. Clearly she knows about these things. Okay. All right. On, 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 on. Um, she talks about several things that she gets wrong, and then she comes along and talks, talks about Sweden. Sweden was kind of a darling of the right-wing media for a while, talking about this kind of stuff. Oh, Sweden didn't have any lockdowns, and they did fine, so that meant that COVID was never really a thing. They didn't need all of the interventions, that, that things would have happened just the way that they did normally without the interventions. Let's look at what people who know about Sweden actually say. Sweden never issued a formal lockdown in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Instead, the country's coronavirus model relies on personal responsibility and encourages citizens to stay at home when they're sick and maintain social distancing when in public. Uh, most things stayed open, but there was no lockdown of Sweden that many parts of the Swedish society have shut down. In other words, no, Sweden didn't order shutdowns. On the other hand, Sweden did say, we need to change our behaviors, and people actually did it. And as a result, numbers in Sweden came down because people were social distancing and people were staying at home and people were doing all of those kinds of things. Even so, they shut a lot down. Uh, the country is reporting one of the highest mortality rates from the virus of any country. Um, things have not gone well for them. May 12th to 19th, Sweden recorded the most coronavirus deaths in Europe per capita. And if you talk to Annika Lind, who's Sweden's former state epidemiologist, she says that their response maybe hasn't been the smartest in every respect. If we had to do this over again, I think we should have imposed significantly tougher restrictions from the beginning. A shutdown could have given us a chance to prepare ourselves, think things through, and radically slow the spread of infection. And then uh, what our friend here gets around to talking about is what she really cared about in the first place, which was, oh my, oh my, COVID is bad for business. This was where all of her motivated reasoning was taking her in the first place. And this is grossly irresponsible because again, something like 85,000 people have looked at this thing. Um, they've gotten their ideas about COVID from this thing. They have probably behaved according to this thing. As a result, they have been exposed. They have exposed other people. People will get ill and very possibly people will die because somebody who did not know anything about epidemiology decided that she was from a big school and she was this person in the business department and she knew better than all of the experts. Okay, um, I just want to finish. I live in Arizona. I want to say a few words. Arizona is facing problems. Here's what happened in Arizona. COVID came along and was starting to, you know, that, that upward curve that we've seen. It was, it was starting to do its, its exponential growth thing. There were interventions. Those interventions had the effect of slowing things down. Very good. Unfortunately, people in Arizona are, yeah, what can I say? We're red, I'll just say it. Um, and so they stopped paying as much attention to those restrictions as they should. And so instead of doing this, Arizona instead started doing this. Actually, it's maybe more. It started doing this. 
now we're opened up everything's go we just had Memorial Day weekend um, I in a week or so numbers in Arizona are gonna go up because essentially we have recreated the conditions under which that was happening in the first place uh, if you look there's a, a group at Arizona State University who actually are epidemiologists and know what they're talking about who have been modeling what's happening in Arizona here we were down here and we we sh we shut things down we turned it down okay we are here but now we've recreated the conditions that led to exponential growth and what they said is that going forward we're going to start seeing their models computer models said we're going to start seeing that exponential growth again and maybe it won't be as bad because after all there are people like my family and I who are continuing to to stay locked down um, but because we are opening up there we go we we could have kept things under control but here in Arizona by the end of the summer we could easily see 20 30 40 thousand needless deaths because people don't believe in science all right um, I could go on with that at length I won't I'll just say that uh, again back to the the Dunning-Kruger effect this is what happens when somebody who doesn't know shit from Shinoa about something that is very important pretends that they do tells the world how they think it is and a bunch of people who don't know any better believe them um i guess i should just finish she was predicting by the way that oh my 80 percent of the population has already had this thing uh reading an article today where we're finally doing some testing and guess what overall in the country maybe about 5% of the people have had it, which means that 95% of the population is still susceptible, which means that we are still very much in a place where that kind of growth can happen. Um, hopefully we'll come to our senses. I don't know. Anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Uh, <sighs> hold on to your hat. It's going to be an interesting... Uh, summer and fall and into the winter and i think i am going to send this video to the person who posted this thing and i think i'll also send it to washington university because i cannot imagine that washington university wants something as irresponsible as this out there in the world with their name associated with it all right thank you much have a good one